Today, Robert Wolf is with us. I used to know him as Robert Hewitt Wolf somehow. When, it's still, that's my, well, that's my screen credit. There, there you go. Back in the day, we worked together for seven years at Paramount, and Robert was in the producer's room, and uh, I was, I guess they call it the writer's room, but all the writers were producers pretty much by the end of the day, and, and we thought of it as the producer's room. It's just a real privilege to have him here. It's really lovely to see him, and it's really nice to see how well you've grown up. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Same to you, you gorgeous man. Um, no, it's just great to, it's great to, uh, Sid and I haven't really interacted much over the last 15 years because I don't really go to the conventions. I've never had to, I've, I've usually been busy. And so, like, that's where everyone sees each other. So I don't, I don't really get to see Sid. So it's, it's really nice to get to see, to get to see him. I, during COVID, I've been trying to do more like, Zoom thingy. So I've seen Armin and Sid and Sirach for the first time in, in a long time. And it's been great. That's great. How, how are you? How, how are you getting on? What's going on in your world? I mean, I guess I'll just be brutally honest. It's been, it's been rough. I was in New York City shooting the first day of an episode of Prodigal Son when they shut everything down for COVID. Mm. And it was the episode I wrote. And my wife had been there the week before and we were in New York City and we were like going to the 9-11 Museum and we went to a we went to see Hades Town over the weekend and we were like walking the High Line. And there were people everywhere. And so then they were like, uh, this is a plague zone. You know, you need to get the hell yeah. out. So we did. Uh, she went home on Tuesday. I finished prepping my episode. We thought maybe we'd be able to finish it. We did the first day of shooting and then it was very apparent that things were not going well. Yeah. And so they shut everything down. And uh, got home, didn't get sick, quarantined for two weeks. And then it's just been a year, man. They, they, uh, Prodigal Son got renewed, but they, they only hired me to really help with those last nine episodes of the first season. And so right. they didn't really need me because they only got 13 for the second season. So they laid me off because of COVID. Since then, it's been tough to get a job as a writer when there's like, you know, every nothing show happening. is getting... Well, there's nothing happening. Yeah, every show is... Um, I, this is getting a little in the weeds, but, but inside showbiz stuff. But the shows, television shows on networks usually get 22 episodes. And a lot of the shows that are getting renewed right now are, are being renewed for 10 or 13 or 12. And even shows that got renewed, some shows got renewed for 22 and then they got their orders. It's called shortening. They shorten the orders. And so when you, the less episodes you do, the less writers you need, you know, yeah. and yeah. the less actors and the less everybody. It's difficult for an actor, but I mean, I'm in the same boat as you. The only shows that are being renewed or coming up, up going squeaking into action right now are shows that have already made a success of themselves and one or right. two that are very heavily backed because they're very promising Sure. Well, for big studios. No one else is prepared to underwrite them because who knows, uh, that getting insured without a vaccine is pretty tough to do. Yeah. Um, so it, I, I, and we do get just six episodes of things. And that's kind of been a, a bummer for actors, partly because you get paid the same amount, but you only do six episodes. Well, the same thing for writers. We get paid by the episode too, my friend. And so, <laughs> like, you know, if you think about, like, when, when Sid and I did Deep Space Nine, we did 26 episodes a year. And that means for Sid and I, uh, we got paid 26 times a year. Yeah. Our yeah. quote. Whatever that quote was, and we were both young, so our quotes were lower. Well, but still, <laughs> but were, well, I was pretty low too. My I was the it lowest, was I was good. the lowest ranking writer on the show. It was still good, but times twenty six. Yeah, it that's adds a good up. number. And yeah, so, I walked into a car showroom and bought a Chrysler Baron because I like the color, just like that. That was my first ever. In, just nice. I just bought it to to hell with it. I thought I'll have that one, nice. and I drove I, it out of the room. I waited a while. Uh, uh, the, this is a true story. Like the first day, I got hired onto Deep Space Nine the same day. A, a writer named Narain Shankar. Within a week, he bought himself like a Mazda RX Seven, a really hot sports car from back in the day, and I was like. I, and I just kept driving my, my <laughs> Nissan Sentra for another year. But then I got a Ford Probe, which was a cool little car. It wasn't as expensive as an RX-7. It was kind of in the Chrysler LeBaron. Uh, in the in Chrysler LeBaron area? Yeah, it was just sort of, yeah, it was a, it was a, it had a sunroof instead of a, instead of a convertible. You're, you're running, you're fl flying around Los Angeles with your hair blowing in the wind. I was, I was in my bright green LeBaron. And we bright drove green. to Las Vegas. I shipped my two, three best friends from England over. We shot. 
a video of you know the Queen Bohemian Rhapsody all with I mean we completely did a whole number on it <laughs> uh, with the four we, screens and all that all everything. that everything we just did That's the whole awesome. thing with uh, and sadly that whole the video is just lost to oh, it's the one oh, I want to see it so bad I too I would too but we drove down to Las Vegas just playing Counting Crows all the way because we were really into Counting Crows at the time. That's awesome. And August is Everything, that album. I had enough money to give everybody $300 and say, just go have fun. Let's go, just go gamble. And we That's gambled. Awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. It was all over. Yeah, the, the heady days of, of like, when you get your first showbiz job, especially back then, like I said, 26 episodes. I mean, I went from having, I, I went from eating like, brown rice and and ramen to like having real money for the first time in my life and it was like i can do a lot of things with this that i didn't i I wasn't able to do before so i helped my sister figure out now any number times 26 is really good but any number times six it's not as good (laughs) it's just not as good (laughs) it's not as good that's just the way it goes so even though the number's larger, because we're both older, it, it would have tough. to be four times as big to get close to where we were before. Uh, so that ain't happening. Anyway, there's a great story about James Garner. He was the star of a, a show called The Rockford Files. I remember him well, yeah. There was a young actor who came on board for like a guest role, and he came up to James Garner and he said, Mr. Garner, I admire you so much, and this is like my first job, and I just want to know if you have any advice. And he said, three things, kid. Know your lines, be on time, and never buy an effing boat. <laughs> that <was it. laughs> That's important advice. Never buy a it's boat good. is really important yeah. advice. Because when you make a bunch of money as a young actor or a writer, there's, there's an instinct that like, I can go buy a boat. You know, No, don't buy the boat. Save the money for COVID. You're going to need Absolutely. it in 20 years, baby. This wheel on our first uh, uh, victim. Our first victim is Jackie. Good to see you again, Jackie. It's good to see you too. Yeah, so it's been a while since we've talked. What's going on? I actually had a lot going on. Just this last week, I was in a On a Trek podcast talking about disability in Star Trek, which was yeah. a lot of fun. That's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Was it a lot of people talking about disability or was it just one, one element of the, of the podcast? I was actually the guest talking about disability. Right. Right. Because that's kind of my wheelhouse, especially yeah. where track is involved. And yesterday was the International Day of Disability, which is part of why it got released that day. I did not know that. That's really good to know. Thank you very much. You see, I have my head in the sand because of what's going on at the moment. I try not to watch the news because it's all about Trump, 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 Trump. That's really good to know. Talk about Melora, probably. Yes, we talked a fair bit about Melora. From what I understand, she was actually originally planned to be a regular on Deep Space Nine, but then it was decided that that would be too difficult. There was some some early thought by Michael that, that, that he would create a character, but I can't speak for Michael about why that didn't happen, like why she wasn't a regular. I know that it was important to him to do that episode. Evan wrote that episode, and Evan was also uh, in a wheelchair. I think that there was a lot of interest in doing it, I don't know why that character wasn't part of the regular cast from the beginning. But you know what interests me about that idea, especially disability in Star Trek? And I don't know if you brought this up on the podcast, but it's a, it's a tricky one to, to pull off because, you know, the, the medic, medical world is so far advanced by that time that disability would have to be so beyond even Star Trek medical capabilities to solve, to, you know, fix. And so that was one of the things that we talked about when, when Daphne came on the show is that, well, it's kind of an interesting area because really, yeah, this shouldn't, you shouldn't be in this situation. We should be better, better than this. We should have you up and running because we are capable of doing all sorts of other extraordinary things, close to bringing people back from the dead. Um, and yet we can't do something that's, as ancient as the hills that, uh, that and people have had studied for a very long time. Did that does that come up in in your podcast? It does a little. Well, not in this podcast. I've talked about that aspect of it before. But the thing is, bodies will always find a way to fail. Yeah. Also, Star Trek is written for a world that needs to like we're not a utopia, and we need to make room for disabled people that we don't make room for right now. Yeah, yeah. And so, if Star Trek shows. Even if you feel like you can probably cure it, 
I know what you're saying exactly, and I love what you're saying. It's necessary to, pr to present the challenge before the audience. And it's necessary yeah. to present the challenge before Starfleet Medical if, that's the, if they're the people that, that need to be presented the challenge to, to. And I agree wholeheartedly. I think it's worth yeah. manufacturing the situation, even if it doesn't exist um, or shouldn't exist um, technically. Yeah. Because as you say, disability will always find a way to win <laughs> whatever yeah. war is being fought on the, in the world. And people will always be left less able than they were before something happened or before they were even born. Part of it is also the diversity of human experience, right? And that I think they did a wonderful job with it with Jordy in, in a lot of ways. I believe there was even an episode where Jordy chose to stay with the visor because that's who he was. It had become part of his identity and part of his understanding of the world. And in some ways, his, his vision was different than other people's, but it was his. And I think that they did a really nice, there was definitely an episode about that. But am I right about that, Jackie? Do you remember that episode? It did briefly come up that Pulaski said that it could be done, but then it never got pursued as far as I remember. But you were with the show, so you would probably know a little well, bit. Well, I, I was, I did one episode of Next of Next Generation, but from what I remember, Jordy had the choice and I think said he didn't, he wasn't really interested in it. When Jordy got eyes in the movie, LeBar kind of pushed back against that a little bit, which I was really thankful for. Yeah, because for sure. yeah, it, it erased it. Representing disability is just showing that space needs to be made and efforts need to be made to incorporate the person. There are social issues associated with disability, and and there are practical issues, political issues that can be addressed. What would you say uh, is the sort of number one political issue? Something, I mean, in England, for example, where it's been a big subject for 30 years, all my, all my adult life, disability has been for, at the forefront of political activism, and rightly so. And it's been, you know, whether it's back in the day in the 30s, I mean, in the 30s, I'm not quite that old yet. But back in the day in the 80s and 90s, it's all about accessibility. And no one could get on a bus and no one could get into a restaurant. And so everything was changed. If you're a public, any kind of public space, you had to be able to, you had, had to have disability access. What would you say that the big, the biggest priority for you personally? I guess for me personally would be making sure that it's actually a living wage that's on disability. As it is, if you wind up disabled in the United States, I can't speak for other countries, but if you want to be disabled in the United States, you are stuck in poverty. Even if somehow you're really great at budgeting and you can get a little bit of savings going, you're not allowed to have more than 2000 in savings. You will lose your benefits if you wind up there. How do people get help? Um, is that this, they have to rely on the state to provide that for them? Yeah, you have those food stamps. Right, most cities have programs that help with housing, but the wait lists are extremely long. Yeah. Like Austin, where I'm at. The wait list is full and to possibly get onto it when it opens up, you sign up for a lottery. The last time the lottery opened up was August, 2018. So for the first time in a very long time, I actually have housing stability, which is nice. I have a really great roommate. I trade off doing some of the chores and stuff around the house and I pay less rent. I'm actually in a very stable place compared to a lot of disabled people. It can be pretty scary. Absolutely. And that on top of the fact that there's a social relevance issue, you know, I'm, you know, People feel irrelevant. I don't know how you manage and be so upbeat and to be, you know, rocking and rolling and ready to, to and coming in here and being so smiley faced and delightful. I think I'm hoping that the incoming government, who seems to be accessible in a way that hasn't been the case, will start to address it like a serious thing, not like a not like a kind of add-on, an addendum to a bill which is gets a, a line item which just gets you know cancelled out by because in England it's I. Sorry to compare, but that's all I got. It, it is a massive issue. I mean, it's, it's, you, political parties run on it. I have never heard it brought up in any of the primaries or any of the, the presidential elections in my memory, which is kind of puzzling to me. Yeah, this administration is actually the first one that has used the word disability in their acceptance speech or even talked about it in general. Let's hope for the best. Um, and let's hope that uh, the priorities are right, that, that people get an allowance raise. You can't obviously do anything with that. I mean, you can, but really it's, it's a pittance, uh, quite literally. Yeah. yeah. How do you budget? How do you figure out what you, because you must be wondering, you must wonder every day whether or not you can do something or not. I get really creative. I was on food stamps and then I started a Patreon. 
So that ended my food stamps because as soon as you make any sort of income, Texas basically ends assistance. I'm really hoping to get on, to get my writing out there really, and to maybe make a career of that because especially right now, there's more remote opportunities for possibly writers rooms and things. Yeah. I've even like my team and I have done two short films during the quarantine distance, sure. like in other states. And I'm lead writer for one of them. So that's, I'm doing stuff. I'm trying stuff basically. But what, what kind of, what kind of thing, what kind of issue is it dealing with and how with, with the remoteness? Cause I love the idea of Zoom drama. The fact that we are secluded is, makes for a really interesting problem for writers. And how do we, you know, I, like Matthew, who's, I, I know he's here today, he's managed to write us a drama that we're, we're not required to be in the same room. In fact, we cannot yeah. be. How, do you do the same sort of thing? Yeah, that's what we did with us too. We had four actors, two of us self-filmed with no director, which was quite a challenge. And then we had another actor with a camera person and director who were in their household. And then the final actor was masked and distanced from one camera person and one director. So we had four different things going on. How did it go? I think it went really well, actually. We didn't win, but this was the first year that I thought we actually could have. Yeah. So I was pleased with what came out of it. And is it a, a national competition or a, what? International. Right. It's called a 48 hour film project. And you get 48 hours and a couple of requirements and you make a five to seven minute short project. film in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, famous. Friends of mine have done that. We've done it eight years now. So. That's great. Wow. And you have to edit in camera because you just can't, you, you don't get to, a chance to, you don't get to edit. You? you have to shoot exactly what you're going to show. Uh, yeah, basically. Wow. And we have a really great editor who we shoot over the footage too, but it's, it's yeah. It's a very quick editing process. They get a, what do you, where do they get about eight hours to do the whole thing probably? We try to give him a full, as much of a full day as we can. Yeah. But yeah, he has to do, we all have to do a lot of work really fast. Yeah, yeah that's just meticulous planning. Everybody knows their role from ev for every second it's counted for. Yeah. And boom, yeah. you go. Just like, you know, doing a play. People know where to stand and exactly when to come in and leave and push. Yeah, it's just phenomenal. Will you show us one day? I would love to see how, what this sort of work is like. It is available and I actually sent it to Mel last week. Very happy, Bunny. <laughs> the link's Thank in the chat, and I will send it to Sid afterwards. Well, listen, it's lovely to talk to you again. But I'm going to get to the chat. Unless you've got a question for Robert or me, you're welcome to, to, to okay. ask any more questions if you'd like. You've got a real writer in front. Well, there's lots of real writers in the club, actually. <laughs> But there's a working one. Well, not right now. <laughs> there's a lot of working ones. Yeah, not right now. <laughs> yeah, actually, if you didn't mind, Robert, what's yeah. what's one thing that you think a lot of scriptwriters should focus more on that, like, kind of miss a bit? I, I think the biggest thing is always character. It's always important to think about who your character is, what they want and what stands in the way. Because really at the end of the day, story is important, but what people are really looking for is a character that they care about uh, going through an experience that they're interested in. But the character comes first. There's been a lot of stories about anti-heroes in Hollywood lately. To mix success in my mind creatively, because at the end of the day, especially in television, you need to want the characters you're following. You need to care about what happens to them. And I think that that's really the big thing. Like, what does that character want? Tell me that. I, uh, there, there's a moment, I used to call it, uh, sometimes I call it the bell, you know, the, the Beauty and the Beast moment. In Beauty and the Beast, Belle sings a song. It's like three minutes into the movie that tells you who she is and what she wants. And you're on board with her from there on. And I feel like that that's a thing that people sometimes neglect with their characters. They neglect to tell us what they want and they neglect to tell us what their perfect vision of what things would be, things worked out for them. And that, that's a huge thing. And so I would just always encourage people to spend a little extra time thinking about that. That goes a long, long way. If you've got good rooting interest, you've got a real leg up on a lot of projects where, the, where you read them and you're like, this is great and the characters and, and the situation is interesting and the world is great and the world building is great. I just don't give a crap about this character. There's a, again, this is just something I think about internally, but I call it like the hit by a bus test. 
if your character stepped off a curb and got hit up by the bus, would I care? Would I? And that was, there's a very famous, there's a couple very famous shows. I just stopped watching because I was like, if that guy stepped off a curb and got hit by a bus, meh, fine. I'd be fine if like, uh, what's his face from Mad Men got hit by a bus at the end of season three. I'd be like, all right, well, that's fine. It's an interesting end to his story. Don, you know Don Draper. If Don Draper got hit by a bus, would the world be a worse place? Meh. I, I, my characters have been hit by more buses than I've had hot meals. <laughs> but look, I mean, uh, speaking of representation, I mean, I, I think about some of the main characters you've played, and even just in the case of like the Prince of Dorne, like you get what he's trying to do. You care about that guy. Part of it's because of the performance. Part of it's because of the writing. Part of it's because you understand that he's struggling with disability and he's trying to hold his back together in this crazy place. That makes that character persuasive. Una McCormack is in this, in the club right now, in the room. And I, I when so I did, <laughs> when I said, we don't have this, talk to a real writer. We have one of the most distinguished writers in the world. In, in here. Exactly. Character first, character, character, character. Um, okay, next up, we're going to talk to Kezi. Hello. Hello. Ah, you're in your Hi. car. Are you driving? <laughs> no. Pull over. <laughs> Where are you? Australia. Oh, my goodness. Unfortunately, where I live, we don't have reception. Normally, I go to the, the Tuesday one, but Robert's here, so I just thought I'd stop in. <laughs> um, you're honoured. How are you doing? How's it? I mean, Australia's doing pretty well right now, but and New Zealand obviously is the poster child uh, <laughs> of responses to this whole horrifying mess we're in. How are you though? Uh, How's your you and your family? We're good. Well, we live rurally, so we're fine. <laughs> and we're also in Tasmania, so oh. it's like a little island. You yeah. almost wouldn't even notice that there was COVID. I mean, there were less people in town when the restrictions were up. Right. You know, people just did their thing and there were terrible fires in tasmania a few years ago wasn't yeah i wasn't here for that my mum was and they had to evacuate for a little bit and what made you move from new zealand to australia my mum was here and all of my siblings we live different states different countries so she was a bit lonely <laughs> so oh. me and my son came over here so your, what's your passion what's the thing you like to try and do Less passion, more vague interests, I guess. I've been trying to learn how to play the ukulele and write stuff, maybe. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I and mean, well, Robert is a fine ukulele player. Oh, wait. I am not. I have no <laughs> musical skills. None. So I, well, I, I, I tried to play the tin whistle once for a little while, but no, I can't. Ukulele, the word itself sounds like it might be in, 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 of New Zealand origin. The word is Hawaiian. Māori has no L sounds. Yeah. So, I've, yeah. I've been to Hawaii. I've, I've been to New Zealand and I've been to Australia. And, but I, I stayed in South Island in New Zealand. You've got Robert to yourself. I'm sorry for taking up so much of your time. You worked on the oh, Dresden yeah. Files, right? I did. I heard that the TV show was really, really different from the books. I just wondered why, why, yeah, why? <laughs> when you have, when you're given a book to adapt, and this has happened to me a few times, there's a few things you have to think about. One is how much of the things that are in the book will translate well onto screen. And some things translate to screen better than other things. Also, when you adapt something, you're being paid by someone. And those people get a big say because they're writing the checks in what they like from the books and what they don't like from the books. So one of the first things you have to do is figure out what the people are paying for you to do this project like, what they want and what they don't want. And so, for example, from Dresden Files, one of the, one of the simple things that, that we found very early on was probably not going to work was that in Dresden Files, this very tall wizard, Harry is 6'7", six, 6'8", six, he has problems with electricity, any kind of high technology. So his solution for having a car that works is to drive a VW Bug because old VW Bugs are very simple electrically. They don't have a lot of, they don't have any computers. And, and so he didn't, he doesn't mess up a VW Bug particularly as quickly as he would mess up like a modern car, like a Tesla. So we managed to cast a very tall actor to play Harry. We got Paul Blackthorne, who is 6'3". A very good actor, but we just happened to luck into getting a very tall actor as well. So he physically matched the character. Paul Blackthorne does not fit into a VW bug. 
The truth is that the real Harry Dresden would never fit into a VW bug. It's incredibly awkward to stuff a 6'8 person into a VW bug. It's it's still awkward to stuff a 6'3 person into a VW bug, especially the old ones, the really old ones. So we had to change the car. And what we managed to get was we managed to get a like a 1950s era Jeep and we put him into a Jeep. You can put a very tall man into it and it doesn't look ridiculous. And so that's why we made that particular change, for example. Another big change from the books is that Bob, his sidekick, his familiar, is a air spirit trapped in a human in a in a skull. And that's great for the books, but that means he doesn't have a face and he can't be played by an actor. So we changed Bob to a ghost of an English wizard who is a person, not a spirit, and could be played by an actor. And then we ironically cast an American to play him. We'd already had a Brit playing Harry, so they would switch their accents whenever the whenever this show started to film. So these are the, there's there's just an accumulation of these kinds of choices. We we try to actually be very faithful to the first book, but even that, the more we worked on it and the more we got notes, everything just changed. And eventually, you know, we I was talking to Jim and saying like this is a parallel universe, Harry. Hopefully, you will enjoy it and you will appreciate it, but it's not going to be a completely faithful adaptation of your books. Sometimes adaptations can be extremely faithful, like Lord of the Rings. But but there's a lot of practical, there's just a ton of practical issues. And sometimes it's very successful. I would argue The Dresden Files was actually a pretty successful adaptation. People really liked it. It didn't quite get enough ratings to get a second season. Uh, but like River World, which I also adapted, was a terrible mess. A lot of those choices are dictated by the people who are paying you. When did you um, start writing? Did, were you when you were a child in, in New Zealand, or when have you been? Well, is it a recent discovery that you've gone? Oh, I'm loving this. Well, I don't really write. I more have ideas, write down the ideas, and then make up different ideas instead of writing because writing's like it's hard. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather just make it up and then maybe forget about it for a bit <laughs> when i actually applied myself and sat down put a piece of paper in front of me i could do all the things like well he picked up a ball and threw it or you know that stuff but as soon as people open their mouths i go i i can't get it right I, they don't sound mm. right they don't, they don't say interesting things that's difficult for me it's a skill it's a craft I can't imagine getting in front of, I mean, memorizing four pages of dialogue overnight and getting in front of a camera and delivering it. That, that's a total skill set that very few people really have. It's the same with writing, I think. People think that writing is accessible to them in, this, in that they can write, like people can write a coherent sentence. The difference between that and writing is the difference between walking and running a marathon, I would say. It's the same skill set, all the same mu mu muscles move, <laughs> you know, and it's really a case of like training and endurance and a little bit of gift. It, but it's <laughs> fun, you know, it's, it, and there's nothing wrong, by the way, with writing, you know, writing stuff down for yourself. And, and I, I think there's a famous quote, I feel like it's Dorothy Parker, but I'm not sure where she said, uh, writing is like sex. First, you do it for yourself. And then you share it with a few friends. And then maybe you might want to get some money for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good don't, you don't have to get money for it. You don't even have to share it with your friends if you don't want to But do what you know, do what you enjoy. That's what I say. Thanks, Kezi. Thanks for turning up and walk all the way from your car in Australia. <laughs> yeah, thanks for finding a good cell zone in Tasmania. And thank you, Robert, for that wisdom about writing. I am, I'm a professional writer, but nonfiction. I'm journalism, so, uh, but I, I can relate to that quote. All right, we're going to go over to Una, who is also a writer. Hello. Hello, Una. You've been embarrassed by me. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> all right. I, I can cope. There's worse <laughs> things that's happened in my life. Embarrassed by Sid. <laughs> it's all okay. Robert, can I can I just fangirl you for a moment shamelessly? Of course, yes. I'm, I'm, I think I'm about, I'm just a tiny bit younger than you. And there I was in the sort of 90s and watching uh, DS9. Seriously, I had a video cassette of The Wire that had <laughs> dropped out that I'd watched it so many times. And it, it's a direct line between watching The Wire and Way of the Warrior, me sort of starting writing and wow. setting on a kind of journey of writing. So you're there in my kind of pantheon with people like 
Chris Boucher and Troy Kennedy Martin. I've got Robert Hewitt Wolf in there. So I'm really grateful to you. You've had a massive influence on me. So just a little fangirl there. <laughs> I, I I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, so fortunate. thank you. I, Are you uh, working on anything right now? No. I am. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing all sorts of um, all sorts of different things. I, I don't think they're announced yet. I've written a couple of things in lockdown. Some of which will see the light of day. Some of and which has, might not. <laughs> you think the, the, this experience has, has changed your approach to some of your more recent work? The thing that's had the most effect on on the way I write is is having a little girl that you just got to parcel out your time more productively. And I think those sort of skills that I picked up when she was tiny, I just had to sort of accelerate those during lockdown. Because yeah. if you've got a six year old and you're homeschooling. You're kind of going, oh, I, and these people want this novel <laughs> in a couple of weeks. So where do we find the half hour where I can kind of She can possibly understand. Six, 600 them. words out. You know? That's right. Just mummy, 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 yeah, mummy. It's not, gonna, and, and it's not going to happen, is it? <laughs> novels are hard, man. I, I yeah. admire just the sheer, I don't know whether people understand the difference between like writing a television episode and writing a novel. But writing a, a television episode is like, I think it's 10,000 words, you know? Mm-hmm. So so a novel, I don't know what your novel's lengths are, but... They're uh, about 80 to 100,000 words. But I tell you what, I get, I have, tr- I have pushed that time down to as brief as possible. Like you say, it's really hard work. It's really lonely. It knackers your back. Oh and you, yeah, yeah, you just want it done as quick as you can. So, um, so I really kind of burn through, and I think you need the concentration. The killer with a novel, I think, is if you get bored. Uh, so yeah. you've got to keep you've got to keep that burn going. I think twelve hundred, I try and do. That's kind of my yeah. I do a sort of two or three productive hours, but that's it. And you get through eventually if you just do that lots of times. You, you get it done. I mean, you spend a great deal of time planning, sort of yeah. prepping your ideas, what, how they're going to, where you're trying to get to, what you're trying to achieve, mm. and making some sort of roadmap. And then the creative period, sitting in front of the typewriter and literally yeah. just going, wow, that surprised me. And, make, and being creative like actors and yeah. directors do in the moment. And then afterwards with all your editorial staff working on how to squeeze this whole thing into something that makes more sense than you thought it did before you know but is it basically that sort of process I I do a lot of planning up front because I I do a lot of tv tie-in writing and the sort of schedules on those are really really tight so you you kind of get the outline in and then your bottom of the heap you know because they're busy making television you know (laughs) so that's that's quite demanding and stressful and then about sort of 10 weeks before your deadline, they come back and say, yeah, that's fine. You can write that. So you go, OK, all right, I'd, 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 better, t- I'd better do that then. Yeah. So you really, really try and plan it as much as you can up front. Absolutely. Otherwise, you're, you, just, you're just sunk. Have you ever written a script? I've done audio scripts i've had audio scripts produced big finish actually you've done big finish haven't you i, I know think. yeah i love big yeah finish. They're, they're, really they're amazing yeah. really oh, really good really- fun did you get one of the famous lunches <laughs> i did i get them every <laughs> single time and they're, they're just amazing and it's always fun for me because i'm always meet another doctor who <laughs> it's like am i gonna yeah. see a doctor who? <laughs> oh you and the other doctor who other so doctor i'm always who. meeting these doctor who's there they're, yeah. and, who are fantastic to meet p.s every time doctor who uh, there's a new doctor who opening I, I i go on twitter and tell everyone it should be sid uh, <laughs> me, me too absolutely just uh, oh, well, I yeah i agree with you except for the fact that i think a woman doctor was was just a, spectacular even yeah. more high time yeah sure so sure but but put me in my she'll, place. eventually she she'll need to regenerate and i think uh, we should yeah, hit my bus the petition starts <laughs> here i think <laughs> And to be both doctors, Sid, that would be amazing. You know, a doctor in Trek pretty. and Doctor Who would be. Like yeah, Absolutely. yeah, yeah. No, you else have a terrific scarf. I know I've seen you in pictures with it. Do you still have that scarf? <laughs> I've got, I get different. I haven't got that scarf anymore. No, I love that scarf. <laughs> God, Robert, I could talk about writing all day. I'm really, I'm just really interested in the creative process. I'm really interested in how I've never worked in TV. So I, I you know, I don't know how that process works at all. I guess I'm really interested in how it it seems such a technical environment, how you sort of think about the constraints of it and how they become a sort of freedom for you. How are you finding story 
in the middle of all those constraints? Where's your freedom as a writer? One of the major difference between writing prose and writing mm. scripts is that prose writing is is essentially a, a solo endeavor. I mean, mm. you're basically playing golf or you're playing, you're running a marathon, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's an individual sport. The second you get into television or film, now, especially television, now it's a team sport. Now you're playing basketball. Now, now it's all about the rules of the playing inside the rules of the game and and mm -hmm. working with your teammates and making things work. In writing, I mean, there's eight writers in a room sitting mm -hmm. down and talking about how the story should work. And ultimately, there's a head writer, for example, Ira, in the case of Deep Space Nine, Michael before him, who makes a lot of those decisions. And so you're even further constrained because you're trying to make that person happy. You know, like, yeah. like when writing on your own, you're just making yourself happy and hopefully your audience. The freedom is in finding moments, those moments of dialogue or that interesting, tweaky, yeah. crazy scene that you figure out or, or the initial story impulse. You know, you find those moments where you can express your creativity inside mm. that framework. I guess it's kind of like, in a way, playing in an orchestra and you get that or a band and now it's your solo. You know, you find yeah. the, the solo moments inside those constructs. Yeah, there's a ton of compromises that have to be made for production. There was an episode of Elementary mm -hmm. where there was supposed to be John Noble's character, Moreland Holmes, invites Joan to a hockey game because he knows she enjoys hockey and they go to Madison Square Garden and they watch a hockey game. And that was supposed to happen. <laughs> and I was writing that episode and we were very far down the road when we realized we would, we could never, like Madison Square Garden was not being as cooperative as we thought they would be. Mm -hmm. And the NHL was not being very cooperative and the Rangers weren't being cooperative and the whole thing became a giant problem. And so they went to a restaurant. That was it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this whole thing that was going to be her going to this hockey game with him and being in this luxury box and all this stuff became a restaurant and that's just a production concern but yeah. the conversation between the two of them i'm still very happy with and that that's where you get like conversations are free like the wire which you yeah. quoted is really just a bunch of conversations between two people and and, and technically it's almost what we call a bottle show where you yeah. really never really leave the sets until you go off to see a nobrin but that's where you can shine as a writer in television. The dialogue, yeah. the conversations, what people say to each other, or weird, interesting takes on a scene. There's a scene in elementary. Sherlock is trying to determine who wrote a piece of music because it's a masked DJ and he, the guy is hiding his real identity. And so he gets a different masked DJ to show up at his house and do a whole bunch of like musical analysis. And she's dressed like a cat, you know? <laughs> and that's just fun to be able to do that. So that's like moments where you can just do crazy stuff and, and, and yeah. that's fun. The bottles are always the best, I think. They're always I love writing know, bottle shows. Yeah, I love writing just, bottle shows because especially when you have actors like Andy and Sid and mm -hmm. you can just like lean into their characters and their dialogue and their performances. Mm -hmm. And then well, what you, is a bottle show? So a bottle show is a show that takes place essentially in a bottle. It's a show where you don't leave the main set. It's the cheap it's one. The cheap <laughs> one. It's the one where the trucks never move. The true bottle show is like either no guest actors at all or just like one or two. And, you know, a lot of shows that take place inside of interrogation rooms or, oh, everyone's yep. snowed in. Or, oh, the bad the guys are on the outside attacking. The or lift, the lift has broken. Stuck, yeah. You know. I had to do shows like that with Kong. We'd, we'd often yep. find ourselves stuck in a pipe for a show. Usually yeah, and, in the second half of the season where, you know, the money's getting a bit. Yeah, well, we had to like, you know, we were, we, you, you did away the warrior and you got to make up that money. Yeah. <laughs> so and now you're doing, you know, now you're doing a, a show where everyone's stuck in the Jeffries tubes for an episode. Those are fun for me. I love doing those mm. as a writer because it really does, it really does lean into like your writing character and dialogue and that's, and if you have good actors, which we did, obviously, then you're you're in really good shape. I love your orchestra comparison as well, because um, I've, I've never played in an orchestra, but I've sung in choirs. But I think part of the joy collaborative work as well, it's not just your solo, but that moment where you're all together hitting that series of notes and you all come in on the right entrance or you just do that last phrase and you're all singing the different notes, but everything together just coheres. And you couldn't have done that anything by yourself, but the whole gang of you, that's it. And that must be writer, actors, production, cinematographer. The weird thing is 
you don't get to experience that all at the same time, though. Yeah, oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we experience it when we see the dailies in a weird way, because yeah. then that's when we see the dailies are what uh, every day you get to see the footage that was shot the previous mm -hmm. day. And so you watch the dailies, and you're like, oh, this scene really came together. Look at that. Mm -hmm. You feel that like, look, the crew is all firing on all cylinders. It's well directed. Mm -hmm. It's beautifully blocked and lit. The the writing that we did mm -hmm. seems to be working really well and the actors are really shining and that's when you mm -hmm. really feel it in television. I don't know when the actors feel it. Do you, when do you feel that feeling, Sid? Um, we don't. We, we, we get a, a oh. brief sense of it in the moment. No, we don't get a sense. I mean, we do because we know the camera's rolling and the loader and uh, focus pullers is stepping away and, you mm -hmm. know, everybody goes quiet and off we go. And then everybody erupts into huge noises and drills and hammers and things as soon as we stop talking and the director says, cut. <laughs> but at, at that moment, it's just us two. But we do get the real sense of that, which, I, mm -hmm. which we love because we, we, we're sort of making love to each other, whoever it is, all the time time that with the most beautiful words that have been thought of very carefully and picked over and chosen um, so you're always absolutely about, never <laughs> done in a rush ever no. <laughs> always done in a rush That's always always sweated over <laughs> television is always in a rush robert's written uh, three novels already but just finished one before we came into covid there's something both of you probably kind of lack in a way as a as a screenwriter Robert must be very a, a bit envious of your freedom, uh, of your creative freedom. But as a, a, a novelist, you must be a bit envious of someone saying the words. Oh, someone, oh you know, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> really, really <laughs> jealous of that. Absolutely yeah. jealous of that. I guess the best person I've had to say my words is I did a big finish that David Warner was in. And it was my best play as well. It's it's the best thing I've written. Now I see why people do theatre. Now I see why they do TV. I was at the recording as well, and it was just a sort of oh my god. And now I understand. It's called The Angel of History. It's a good it's a good play. I think you know when you've done something good. And to have a really I mean someone like that, Lisa Bauman's in it as well. She's in every scene. She's outstandingly good. Um, yeah. Small cast, tight idea, and you just think I see why people do this. I can see why you do this rather than sit at home by yourself for eight weeks getting backache, you know? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I wish I could write a novel in eight weeks. I wish I could sustain my concentration for longer, but... <laughs> <laughs> Took me like a year and a half to re write every one. It was like pulling teeth. Couldn't Sorry. do a TV script in that speed, so... Can you, are you permitted to tell us what you're... Yeah, no, they're all <laughs> out. People can buy them. I, I can show... I actually... I brought show and tell. So I wrote three books... This is the first one. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Goblin Crown. They're YA. They're, it's a YA trilogy. Fantastic. One. On Star. I love the covers. I didn't, I can't take any They're credit beautiful. for them. Beautiful. And then this is the third one that just came out. Uh, this is the one I finished uh, when COVID was starting up. YA stands for young adult. I someone just asked, asking <laughs> yeah. that. And the covers are by someone named Tom Fowler. He's a pretty, very well uh, accomplished. He does a lot of uh, uh, comic book covers and, and stuff like that. They're sort of my philosophical response to the Narnia books. In, oh, in wow. Ways. Fantastic. Uh, and specifically, they're a response to the movie version of Prince Caspian. Oh, wow. Uh, um, okay. Yeah, that's the, niche. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which was my favorite book growing up. Prince Caspian yeah. was one of my favorite books. And then I saw the movie and the Pevensey kids, these English kids from the 40s, are just murdering all these brown people, just mm. killing them left and right and center. It's really problematic. Yeah. Very problematic. And so my response was to write a book in which three modern high school kids, ethnically diverse, a kid who's mixed race, and uh, he's the main character, Billy Smith, and his first day of high school crush, who's um, a Filipina-American girl from Pacifica, California, the bully high school quarterback, who's the only white person in all the books, uh, are magically transported, a la Narnia, into this fantasy world where the goblins have just lost the, their giant battle of uh, Minas Drift. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and they've lost. Billy and his friends get rescued by the goblins. Excellent. But given that you, you're, you're going to you create an idea, you're going to fill it with a bunch of people. I mean, in a way, in a way, Robert doesn't get to do that in the same sense because he has people who hire him who already know the kind of people they want in their show. Now, say you wanted someone from one of the diverse communities. How do you give yourself license to do that? What do you do? 
I guess I have always felt, particularly as a, a, a woman writer of science fiction, that, uh, that I've always been speaking from a marginalised place. So uh, about 10 or 15 years ago, I decided just to stuff my books with women. I started with parity, this track books. I said, let's go with parity. Okay, there's not been any pushback. Let's just make everyone a woman. Oh, there hasn't been any pushback. Okay, <laughs> let's just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. Let's just change pronouns. Let's just, uh, you know, do as much as I can as make it as different, as diverse, as as wide as possible. And it's been okay. People seem to, and I and just listen when people tell you this makes me sad think oh I, di- I didn't want to make you sad I wanted this to feel good I wanted you to feel that you were present in this text so let me listen and find out more do what I can do because I'm lucky now I wasn't I was in a position where I was marginalized and now I'm I'm not I sell a lot establishment. Um, all these sorts of things yeah I, which is a surprise I think you know I don't I just think I'm some grubby scouser you know uh, but <laughs> all I can do is just listen to people. And if they tell me I'm doing it OK, that's good. But I want to know how to do it better. You can just do your best. I think that's all. I just keep on trying because I'm lucky. I've got this tiny little platform and I can just make that work as best I can. And that's Absolutely. all you can do, really, isn't it? I try my best. It's funny, isn't it? When when you approach a bunch of producers who are generally white mm-hmm. and generally sort of middle aged and re- really wealthy. Uh, or, you know, they come out of the system. They certainly don't credit themselves with being creative people. They like to think they are, but they, they can't, they're not, by and large. So how do you have that political conversation? It's like, I really think we need to talk about disability uh, and, and somehow get this into the show. And then how do you dare to do it? <laughs> Does that make sense? How <laughs> well, dare you? Well, here's the first part. I am clearly a white guy. I mean, you know. That's what I, I mean, it's me. So the first thing is to choose to write people who are not like me. And that is both, uh, I think, an important choice. It can be a problematic choice because now you're writing people who you're not representative of. The alternative is for me to just write a bunch of white dudes. And to me, I feel like that that's a disservice. Like that, that's an uninteresting choice. It's not reflective of the culture I grew up in. It's not reflective of the city I grew up in. It's not mm. reflective of my experience as, a, as, a, as an American. So I have to make that choice. So the first thing mm. is I choose not to just write white dudes. Now I've taken on a responsibility to write people who have a different experience with me as accurately as possible or in an interesting way. Mm-hmm. And so I have to take that on because the other, the other alternative is, is worse, I feel. That takes political courage. Do you have, have you had any pushback? I mean, have you had people go, well, uh, you know, we'd like to have, we need more white people. Luckily, you know, in my experience, I haven't really had that. And I've been able to write, you know, my first show, the main character and, you know, a lot, the cat was incredibly diverse. Deep Space Nine was incredibly diverse, especially yeah. for its time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I had to take on very early on, like, okay, I'm writing for these characters. I have to embrace that. I have to do the research. The next thing is like having people you trust who are from whatever Mm -hmm. culture or experience you're writing be able to say to you, well, that's no good or like do this instead. Or so I I have some beta readers I I really trust when it comes to things like that. It was really important for me, for example, to have my friends that I grew up with in San Francisco, many of whom are Filipino or Filipina, to read the books and make sure that Lexi, Mm -hmm. the Filipina girl, the Pinay girl is well articulated and do, and mm-hmm. felt real to them. And to have friends of mine that are mixed read the books and make sure that Billy's experience felt real to them. Yeah, It's a complicated issue. I mean, it's, it's complicated for everyone. For me, it's like, I don't want to be culturally appropriating. I don't want to be mm-hmm. patronizing. Uh, but I also don't want to write a world with just a bunch of white dudes in it. At a couple of really critical moments in my career, a couple of my male peers turned down good opportunities for them and said, you need to ask a woman and here's Una's name. And that made a massive difference to me. Um, you know, it, it got me on things like national radio or it got me, you know, these kinds of things. And that's something I try and remember to do. Actually, it's not me you want to talk to. It's this younger voice that's more representative. I can write diversely as possible, but what matters is the people in the room and you've got to give them a leg up. There's a couple of projects that on reflection, I've gone, 
I should have suggested someone else. And I'm trying to be mindful of that going forward because it's at the end of the day, we can write all these things, can't we, Robert? But we've got to get these people in place behind us. You've got to pay these people to write, produce, act, direct, and you've got to give them a leg up because that's what will change it. That's the only way things will change, I think. Amplify those voices and make sure these people get paid work. It's one of the things our industry is finally doing as an industry. Yeah. It's something I've been trying to do through my career, and I, I think mm. I've been helpful to some people. But I also think like it's good that the entire industry is finally probably yeah, yeah. through shame, <laughs> yeah. you know, and embarrassment, <laughs> finally going like, well, maybe we should have had African-American writer on Deep Space Nine all along. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, I, I won't say it shouldn't have been written by a bunch of white guys because you had some pretty good white guys. Well, mm. not only that. Well, we did have two Latinos on our our, our yes, that's uh, true on right. our staff. Yeah. So yeah. That was that's good. True. We didn't have any women. Um, well, so you know, pathetic. I just wasn't available at the time. So yeah. exactly. <laughs> well, we we found Lisa Clink and then Voyager poached yeah. her, and we gave a lot of people their first uh, opportunities. Mm. But yes, there's definitely situations where I'm like, no, no, go go. I'm not writing this. Listen, thank you both. Really, yeah. thank you. Really, really lovely. Thank goodness you, you got in and came and talked to us because you, you're just lovely to hear. Thanks, sis. Um, Thanks for listening. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's really well, nice to talk to you, Robert. Really good to meet you. Thanks. <laughs> good to meet you as well. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. That was a fantastic conversation. Hello. You're in a very dark room, but we can see you just fine. I take Zoom classes and then as it gets darker, I'm, I'm in Canada, I, it's harder and harder to find lights. And if I put the light on behind me, then it's just like I have to hold still and hide the light. That's <laughs> true. That's yeah. true. What class do you yeah. take? I take so many different classes. I'm kind of switching careers. So I, I would like to go into film. So I'm a filmmaker. So I take every single class. Like I've been taking production management. I took starting a production company. Uh, with Second City, I take acting classes since September, which is fun to meet people. And apparently I can act, which surprised even me. <laughs> it doesn't surprise me. That's so nice. <laughs> a lot of people can act and they, they just, I mean, like, I, I think a lot of people can draw. A lot of people can, t- can sing and a lot of people can act and they just don't know it. <laughs> just not, not practicing that muscle enough. So what kind of films are you interested in making? And, what, and have you already started? Is that something you're already doing? I have started. So I made my first film this summer with a bunch of friends of mine over Zoom. It was for a, like, you had to make a five minute horror film over the course of four weeks. So I wrote it, I got everyone together. Uh, Unfortunately, I had to be in it, but I think I did fine. And then I edited it and we got it in and we didn't win, but I submitted it to a film festival and we got in there. So it's really rough, but I was like, we got into a film festival. That's pretty good for like a first try. Yeah, that's a huge deal, in fact. <laughs> it's not that scary. It's kind of arty and then like a weird comedy because I have a hard time making horror in a time that's already horrifying. So we kind of leaned into more sort of the comic kind of side. So if you weren't like my 10 year old niece watched it, and she was like, it was just weird. <laughs> <laughs> so do you write your own stuff? I do. I'm right now working on my second film, which I'm taking a lot more time with. We have our last recording session tomorrow, but it's animated, so it won't be finished until March. So that's yeah. ambitious. I like that though, but it's I've blocked it out into what I'm doing, and so it's not impossible. Of course, it won't be like Pixar quality, but it's going to be this. I love the story. It's about a woman who's woken up in the middle of the night by two interdimensional beings asking for a cup of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> great idea. It's a great start, start to a story. Um, my work, I still go to work. I work in a factory, but I don't work with a lot of people and the air is removed every 15 minutes. So it's unlike a lot of factories where it's pretty prevalent that people get COVID. I don't have that problem. So wow, I'm fairly that- lucky. I absolutely love the first season of the 4400 and i see that you wrote one of my favorite episodes and you're also the consulting producer what does that mean and how did that work that's a good question so credits on for writers on television shows are are sort of a reflection of rank this is how i used to explain it to my father so if you see someone uh, credited as a staff writer or a lot of times they're not credited at all that's essentially like think of them as like a second lieutenant they've just come out it's their first job Story editor then is a first lieutenant. Executive story editor is a captain. Co-producer is a major. 
producer is lieutenant colonel. Supervising producer is a colonel. And anyone with the title of executive producer is some version of a general in terms of their authority in the production and in the writing room. Consulting producer then is basically a warrant officer, if anyone knows what that is in the military. It's someone who normally gets a different title, but it's taken the consulting producer title and is probably working for less money, but also working less hours than they normally work. They're sort of like, I'm not an executive producer on this show. I'm not a supervising producer on this show. I don't have the level of authority, but I also, also don't have the same level of commitment, but I'm probably not getting paid my full amount of money either. <laughs> That's what a consulting producer is. Yeah. It, it's reflective of the fact that you probably deserve more money and, and, a, and a more important rank, but you, you're not getting it. And therefore, the <laughs> okay. trade-off is you don't have the same level of time commitment and yeah. you don't have the same level of what they call exclusivity. In other words, when you're on a show, you're on that show and you're not supposed to be working on anything else. Uh, you might have some carve outs for some other things, but mostly your 99% of your time is supposed to be dedicated to that show and you're working yeah. crazy hours. When you're a As, consulting uh, producer, yeah. you're able to take other jobs. You're able to work on other things. You, you, you can go out for meetings more easily. It's just, you're less restricted. On um, 4,400, for the first season, I, I came on. I was there the whole time we did the miniseries, which was six episodes. I came back for the fourth season, and it was kind of the same thing. I'd just come off of Dresden Files. Ira needed someone to help out for like 10 weeks in the writer's room. They had a certain amount of money, and we did the math, and that amount of money was like three-fifths of what I normally earned. So they gave me a consulting producer title, and I worked three days a week three or five half days or whatever. We just sort of figured it out that, that that's how we prorated it out. But I wrote two episodes of that show and I helped launch it. I, I did a lot of work on the miniseries. And then in the four season, I sort of came in just to, to sort of pinch hit a little bit and help out. Yeah. Have you ever been, Robert, on, on a show embedded like proper producer and a, another great offer or idea comes your way and you go, can't do it, but my God, it sounds great. And oh, I wish I could have at least been able to sniff at that. Occasionally. The, the times that that's happened, honestly, when it happened the most, I was on elementary and I was having a ball and getting paid a crap ton of money. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, when you're on a show that's doing, like we said at the beginning, elementary was doing 24 episodes when most shows were doing 10 you know, yeah. and, and it was a terrific cast and wonderful people. And it was a, and a great time. show. Yeah. yeah, it turned out great, too. So so it's usually like a, a high class problem, right? You, yeah, you, it is. Absolutely. It's the same thing as being an actor on a show and not being able to take guest roles yeah. or do a pilot for a different show. Yes, that sucks on some level. But on another level, you're you're a regular on a television show. And that's the position that it's a, it's a wonderful yeah. position to be in as an actor. I mean, we never hear about it. Actors never hear that they, there was an offer for them for something else because our agents simply just don't pass on that information. Same thing. <laughs> like the same thing. A lot of offer, the offers never even get to me if yeah. I'm on a show. Uh, but, but there's also like people now, especially in the, in the days of the internet and internet accessibility and writers all like talking to each other on you know, Twitter and stuff like that. People approach me directly sometimes for things. So now I know about things I'm turning down a little bit. More. <laughs> so what, what is your ambition, Diana? What are you going to do? Are you going to make bits and bobs? Are you going to deal with the art history? Or are you going to cruise into filmmaking? Or maybe a combination of all three? I think it, like art history is never going to leave me, but I really hate working in academia. It just, I did it for about 10 years and it was just, oof, no, thank you. And I don't want to deal with that. Was it the, 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 the struggle for tenure or the back, the professional bitching, backbiting difficulty? <sighs> Man, you got like seven years for me to explain it, but uh, sorry, nope. no, I should okay. make some, some it, it ranges. <laughs> it ranges from issues like toxic workplace, um, sexual harassment, uh, just basic. Like I always say, I left my job because of the table of like human rights violations that I no longer wanted to deal with. So, yeah, yeah. I'm out. <laughs> for you absolutely good for you. That's your only choice, frankly. Yeah, I think like when I, I was, I think I was asking for a raise because I was working, do, teaching and working in the factory. And my boss said to me, oh, why don't you just go ask the robot factory for a raise? And I said, well, actually, the reason why we're having this conversation is because they've offered me full time with like substantial benefits and all this. So this is the competition to let me stay because someone else wants me more. Yeah. And they didn't go. even know how to deal with that. They're like, 
people want you? It's like, I am good at my job. Like, <laughs> wherever I go, I do a good job. I don't understand why you can't see this. And that sounds like a terrible, a very good reason to leave a, a job. Good for you for getting screwing down your courage and doing it. Um, but what, what part of art history was your favorite thing? What makes you most jazzed? Warhol's a fascinating person because there's so much about his life that was hidden. Like, I loved Andy Warhol when I was a teenager, and only, I think, the last two years, I actually found out that he was gay. And it's never talked about in art history, and one of his films is eight hours of taping this man sleeping. And the way that it's taught in school is that it's this exercise of boredom. When I read a book, I found out, oh, that was actually a more erotic. And it completely changes the read, because when you have a crush on someone or you love someone... You will watch any mundane thing that they do and think it's the most like entrancing thing. And it's like, how could they leave this out? Is it just because they're homophobic? Because now it's like, I understand why he could spend eight hours watching him sleep because he was in love with him. Like, it's a yeah. big deal. Yeah, that's actually very poetic. It's a very yeah. poetic gesture. Quite different from some of what the other stuff he was doing, which was not poetic, it was quite cynical. No, it was very <laughs> cynical. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for tuning in, uh, Kyle. I mean, no, Kyle, I've got all my names <laughs> messed up. Diana, and thank you, Robert. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I really thank enjoyed it. Saying hi to us all. Uh, thank you, all of you, every guest. That's it for this week. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Robert, so much for coming on and talking. Thank you, Robert. It's great. It's really fun. Thank you for having me. Bye. Thank you very much, Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye.